Thank you so much, Brian. So good afternoon to all of you. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I appreciate very much the, the welcome, the warm welcome, as is, as is the, the want of the Sheptitsky Institute to, to welcome warmly, and it's good to see all of you. Um, so I'll be speaking, uh, in, initially I'll say a few words about who Ignatius was. I don't want to assume too much about what uh, people may know, so it may be familiar territory. I'll say a bit about who Ignatius was and some of the main hallmarks of Ignatius, um, uh, Ignatius' outlook and his spirituality, and then tie that in with um, the Byzantine, Byzantine tradition. My own background, I, I, I'm quite steeped in the, in the uh, Ignatian tradition, and I am uh, uh, continuing to discover with great, uh, with great excitement the Byzantine tradition. So I, I would say that uh, um, some of the things I'll say about the Byzantine tradition are more tentative, and I'm, I'm eager to learn from any comments or questions you may have into, as I continue to, to reflect on these things. So when we talk about Ignatius of Loyola and the Ignatian tradition, it's the Ignatian, Ignatian spirituality is uh, the spirituality arising from the life, from the insight of Ignatius of Loyola, who was a Spaniard who lived at the turn of the 15th into the 16th century. Um, and he, he, he was born in Diego Lopez. He was a, a minor aristocrat. And he was an extraordinary figure, even if even if he weren't of interest to us because of uh, what we're studying or because of his uh, spiritual uh, impact, uh, Ignatius was quite a character. He, uh, he, was, he was filled with dreams of military valor and he was filled with dreams of uh, impressing the ladies. He had this, there's some mysterious woman in his life whom he wished to impress with his deeds of, of daring do. We don't know much about who she was, but that somehow makes it more interesting. <laughs> so Ignatius Inigo, he started off as simple Inigo, was a, a military leader and defended his town of Loyola against an onslaught of the French, as one does. And <laughs> in the midst of his defense of the city, he wanted to rally his troops. And so he jumped to a spot where his troops would see him, which was on a wall, a parapet surrounding the, the area they were defending. But of course, when his men could see him, so could the French. And so they fired a cannon at him, and the cannonball shattered one of his legs. A horrific injury by, by, uh, no matter, by, by any standards, a horrific injury. The French took him captive and were so impressed slashed annoyed by the feistiness of their new prisoner that they returned him to his family. This is sometimes presented as a gesture of, of, uh, of respect, I sometimes wonder if the French weren't saying, you know what, we've had enough of this guy, you take him. We, you know, Because he was a man of, of great uh, character. So he, he convalesced in the family home for several months. Uh, as, as one would expect, a, a cannonball injury to the leg would, would take some time to heal. And there is a, a bit of a plot twist even there. As his leg was healing, he was dissatisfied with how it looked. And in those days, men wore, wore silk tights, or aristocratic men wore silk tights. And he thought, this won't do. It wasn't sufficiently elegant. So he instructed, take a moment uh, to, to take this, and he instructed the surgeons to re-break his leg. This is in a time without anesthetic, because he wanted his leg to have just the right sort of uh, shape. So he was, he, was, he, was a, he was a tough character. And as he lay convalescing, he, he grew bored, because there was not much he could do. He was confined to bed. And his devout sister had nothing in the house but a life of the saints and a life of Christ uh, by, a, by a Carthusian. And he was so bored that eventually he, he capitulated and was willing even to read that. There was a time when he thought, if you don't have any novels, that's okay. I'll, I'll be satisfied with the, you know, looking at the ceiling or whatever it was that he was doing. But he became bored, and so he began to read these texts, the life of Jesus and the life of the saints. And... This was the turning point for Inigo's life. In Inigo's life, he realized that when he daydreamed about his feats of military valor, that it left him happy while it was while it was happening, and left him feeling dissatisfied afterwards, left him feeling empty and hollow. But that when he imagined, when he daydreamed about the life of Christ, the life of the saints, suddenly that left him with a joy that lasted. It left him with a sense of peace that lasted, and this was something that Inigo couldn't ignore. There was something about this experience of dwelling in the presence of his own ego or dwelling in the presence of his own honor, his own grandeur, that left him feeling desolate. That's a bit of foreshadowing. And there was something about the experience of dwelling with the person of Christ 
in his prayer that, or even in his imagination that left him feeling uh, with a, uh, left him with a, a lasting peace. This is, this is not a presentation about the life of Ignatius, so I'll, I'll encourage you to, 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 to take that up um, as, as something worth reading. His autobiography is called A Pilgrim's Journey. It's translated into English as A Pilgrim's Journey. It's his own account of his life. But to make a long story short, that experience in his sister's house was the turning point that led him to, to change, to, to adopt a new... Uh, vision of what his life was to be about. He saw himself as following a new captain, following a new leader. So the language of Ignatian spirituality is sometimes military. The language of the exercises, which is the text in which he set down the, the rough outlines of his experience, it's sometimes military, but, but there's a lot more to it than that, which, which, uh, I, uh, which I will allude to momentarily. So to, to know... Uh, when did Inigo become Ignatius? With this moment of conversion, he adopted the name of Ignatius of Antioch as someone whom he admired, as someone whose model he wanted, example he wanted to follow. So Inigo Lopez became Ignatius, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, and uh, immediately with this new life as a as a uh, uh, a devout man, with his new life as a spiritual advisor, a spiritual director, and eventually as a priest, he he drew people to himself. He, uh, a group of young men gathered around him and they became the nucleus of the company of Jesus, the Society of Jesus, or as we call them today, the Jesuits. Jesuit was originally a term of reproach, a term of derision, and is so often, as is so often the case, the group adopted it as a, as a term of pride. You call us the Jesuits very well, we're the Jesuits. So the spiritual exercises are not, which are the, the text in which this spirituality is, is transmitted to the, to the church and to the faithful, it's not something you can sit down and read cover to cover with great interest. It's, it would be, it's a bit like reading a phone book, if you take it in that light. It's not intended to be read alone. And again, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, an underappreciated resource for understanding who Ignatius was are his letters. So if you are interested in exploring more about Ignatius, I would strongly encourage you to read uh, his letters because they're full of insights that s some of it has not fully been uh, exploited or captured. So how can we come to speak of, of the Byzantine tradition and the Ignatian tradition? There don't appear to be any uh, obvious or overt Byzantine influences in Ignatius's life. He was taught by the Dominicans, and his own spiritual formation was in the hands of the Benedictines. Uh, at one point, um, Ignatius had adopted what perhaps using a, a, an, Eastern, an Eastern category, had adopted the manners of a, of a fool for God. You know, he, was, he had stopped taking care of himself. He, he was, he was uh, defying or flouting the conventions of society. Um, but a Benedictine spiritual director advised him that this was, not, this was not going to be healthy for him, that this was not ultimately what, was, what, uh, what would be constructive for him or for the faithful who were turning to him. And so with the guidance of this Benedictine, Ignatius abandoned his extreme ascetic practices and, uh, and took, up a more, uh, took up a more disciplined life, one that, that allowed him to do all the things that he did. So in short, there don't seem to be clear Benedictine influences, uh, sorry, Be uh, Byzantine influences in Ignatius. If we, if we look at the, the influence in the opposite direction, to what extent has Ignatius had an influence or had a presence in the, in the Eastern tradition, in the Byzantine tradition, there are, there are some traces of this. So uh, most prominently, uh, Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, whom, as you know, uh, translated uh, Scupoli's spiritual combat as unseen warfare. This is a text that's, that's beloved uh, in, uh, in the Byzantine community. Nicodemus, also one of the, the editors, compilers of the Philokalia, he translated a version of the spiritual exercises uh, and uh, it, as a pneumatica gym, a gymnasmata. Sometimes this is referred to as a translation of the spiritual exercises of Saint, Ignatius, uh, of Saint Ignatius. As far as I can tell, that's, that's incorrect. I, as far as I can tell, Nicodemus did not translate the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius. What he translated was a version or a sort of... Um, a popularized version of the exercises that that's uh, from an Italian author uh, named Pina Monti. So sometimes you'll read that Nicodemus translated the spiritual exercises. I don't think that's true. So Nicodemus expurgated the these exercises for the delicate sensitivity of his fellow Athenites. 
So purgatory is gone. The merits of Christ are gone. Any examples featuring women are gone. <laughs> so it's an expurgated spiritual exercises. Uh, but it is an example of this Ignatian thread being received into the Byzantine tapestry. Not unproblematically, though. Um, there are examples of informed uh, Eastern voices, such as Bulgakov, uh, repudiating the all-important place of the imagination in uh, Ignatius' writings. And we'll have to come back to that. So there is, it's, there is communication, there is dialogue between the Ignatian and the Byzantine traditions, but it's not a, it's not a simple or an easy communication. And of course, in popular discussions of, of hesychasm, uh, where, when they do allude to Ignatius, often echo this tension with a thoroughgoing repudiation of Ignatius. But I, I do want to emphasize that those are popular voices, not necessarily ones that are, uh, that are deeply imbued with, with either of these traditions. So what are some traits of Ignatian spirituality? If we're going to talk about points of, of comparison and points of, of uh, tension, it's helpful to know some, in broad outline, some major traits uh, of Ignatian spirituality. So in general, I think in the West, it's helpful to think of, of any tradition of spirituality as being uh, deeply informed by the experience of one person, of, of one given individual. Um, it, certainly in the Byzantine tradition, we see specific individuals having a... a, a a lasting, a known importance. But in the West, when we speak of Benedictine spirituality, Dominican spirituality, Franciscan spirituality, it's clear that it is often a reflection of the experience of one person in which one person simply sought to, to follow the promptings of the Spirit and in, it became uh, uh, an example that was so compelling that others adopted it. Others said, yes, this, this is how I too can become a saint. And so a person will, will say, will be drawn to the Benedictine emphasis on balance between work and prayer or the Franciscan uh, exuberance and, and love of poverty, or the Dominican um, emphasis on, on the intellectual life. So the, each spirituality is a way of living and praying that initially is the way of living and praying of one individual. So if we take Ignatius' example as, as fitting into this pattern, uh, Ignatian spirituality is often summed up with one of several mottos. These are mottos that you may have heard. I suppose a, a more apt word nowadays would be a hashtag. So there are Ignatian <laughs> hashtags, so to speak. If you've heard the expression, finding God in all things, that's, that's a classic Ignatian formulation. Ad maiorum dei gloriam, for the greater glory of God. Everything that's done should be for the greater glory of God. That's a, a typically Ignatian hashtag. The manner is ordinary. This is something that Ignatius writes as a, a way of describing the life of the Jesuits. He he. He, set, he defined the Jesuit life as one that wasn't marked by living apart in community like, like a monk or even like the Dominicans, but it's the life of an ordinary parish priest. That's how he saw the, the society of Jesus. So he, he says the manner is ordinary, and that's sometimes used as a way to define the, the Jesuit ethos. And the last example would be men for others. Again, an expression that's often uh, used to define the ethos of the Jesuits, and that's meant to capture something about Ignatius. So these are helpful distillations or reminders of the insights of the spiritual exercises and of St. Ignatius's life generally, but of course, they don't provide a detailed program, right? Saying, finding God in all things, it's a, it's a beautiful value, an overarching value. It doesn't give necessarily the tools for day-to-day for, for -day decisions. And they're not uniquely Ignatian. They're not Ignatian to the point that we would say Dominicans don't find God in all things, or the Benedictines or Byzantines don't find God in all things. That's reassuring, isn't it? If, if Ignatius came up with a totally new way of being holy, one would, one would be right to be somewhat suspicious of it. So it's not, it's not that Ignatius claims to have discovered a new planet, but simply uh, a unique way of, of getting to a planet that's already known. So I think if we're going to talk about the, 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 the defining features, the things that are most truly Ignatian, we can see them in two particular categories. So I'd like to, to look at those two categories and then uh, connect that uh, to the Byzantine to the Byzantine uh, to, to Byzantine spirituality. So when we when we when we boil down Ignatius's life, when we boil down his letters, when we boil down the spiritual exercises, I think we find the distinctive values uh, falling into one of two categories. There's doctrinal uh, or thematic anchor points, uh, and these are consciously uh, rooted in the Catholic tradition. And then there's, so that's on the one hand, the sort of notions, the values that, that underlie Ignatian spirituality. 
And then there's the strategies and the precepts, the, the ways that Ignatius found of getting there, the ways that Ignatius found of implementing those, those values. So when, we'll start with the first category. What are some, some themes that, are, that, are, uh, that give shape, that, give, that, that, that mark the DNA of Ignatian spirituality? There are three, three in particular that I think are worth underlining. First has to be the theme of freedom and radicality. Um, for Ignatius, nothing is more important when embarking on the spiritual life, nothing is more important than when trying to follow the call of God than being free, being free of anything that constrains or binds or ties you up. Um, the, the, the spiritual exercises are divided into four weeks, um, and in, in its most classic experience, someone who lives the spiritual exercises literally will go apart for a month, normally away from their daily business, from their daily life, and will take a month to go through these exercises, and that month is divided into, into four weeks. So the first of those weeks um, is devoted to freedom. The first of those weeks is devoted to, to attaining interior freedom. And Ignatius calls this the principle and foundation. The Ignatian, in Ignatian spirituality, we call it the principle and foundation. It's so, um, it's so important that uh, it, it has its own acronym in, in Ignatian circles. It's sometimes simply called the PNF, the principle and foundation. And the idea is that until we are free from anything that attaches us, we are not really capable of moving forward. It's a, it's a radical invitation to, to examine what it is that constrains us. And so Ignatius uh, proposes some pretty uh, tough exercises in that first week. And until those exercises are assimilated, are internalized, it's not really possible to continue with the exercises. And so it will, among other things, I'll just give one example. Ignatius asks the exercitant, the person doing the exercises, to ask, Am I, if, if God wishes me to be poor rather than rich, to be sick rather than healthy, if that's what God wants, is that what I want? And of course, I can't speak for you, I can only speak for myself. The answer is a resounding, of course not. Of course I don't want to be, I mean, who would? But Ignatius, th that's, that's where we see the, the military uh, side of Ignatius coming out. This, this is what you need to do. Are you ready to do it? If you're not ready to do it, then you're not ready. So freedom and radic radicality, the principle and foundation without which nothing else is possible. That's the first kind of thematic or doctrinal anchor point. The second thematic anchor point of Ignatian spirituality is the, is the phrase or the sentiment sentire cum ecclesia to think with the church to think with the church Ignatius was uh, first and last a man of the church he, he did not wish himself to be seen or to see himself as anything but a man of the church if, if anything he did or said uh, was contrary to the, to the wisdom to the life of the church he didn't want anything to do with it now as is the case with most, as is the case with most saints and and uh, and pioneers, Ignatius didn't always have an easy time with the the powers that be in the church, um, and that was a source of suffering for him. It wasn't something he brushed off. He was not willing to become a founder of a new religion by any means. Centuria cum ecclesia, to think with the church. Now, this is not always the very first thing that comes to mind nowadays when people think <laughs> Jesuits, and I don't. I don't intend that in a snarky way. It's simply it's a reality of the church that when people think Jesuit, they don't always think Centuria cum ecclesia. But I, I do want to say that to some extent, that is, I think, a caricature. There are perhaps cases where it's not a caricature. But let me take an example of a, of a recent, a relatively recent Jesuit who fell under this cloud of suspicion, someone who was deemed to be not really someone who is Centuria cum ecclesia, and that's Henri de Lubac, French Jesuit, member of the French Resistance, um, uh, one of the great, as we know now, one of the great scholars and theologians of the 20th century. It's easy for us to say now, one of the great scholars and theologians of the 20th century, just it rolls off the tongue. But in the, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and especially in the 30s, he was not thought of by all as a great theologian, a great scholar. He was a, he was a, a member of this, this, this suspicious, this... this un, um, uh, this dodgy new theological movement, nouvelle, the la nouvelle théologie, because it sought to to delve into the into the writings of the fathers, because it proposed to read Aquinas directly and not not as mediated through a uh, hundred thousand charcoal filters of scholastic commentaries on scholastic commentaries. So de Lubac, many people held him and his colleagues under suspicion because they thought these these guys are not centuri cum ecclesia. 
But of course, with time, his insights have proved to be more lasting, I would dare say, than many of his contemporaries, certainly than most of his, most of his critics. I don't know that many of us would, read, would willingly read uh, those who criticize de Lubac most, uh, most resoundingly. So the willingness, the Jesuit willingness to, pro, to say and propose surprising things is closely tied to their Ignatian DNA. Sometimes it can go off the rails, but that's one of the, the liabilities of, of placing creativity and compassion at the center of one's modus operandi. So maybe let's keep th- those ideas in mind as, 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 a, as part of the way that the, the Ignatian tradition lives Centuria cum Ecclesia. To live Centuria cum Ecclesia with creativity and compassion, and sometimes that leads to, to, to moments of moments of tension. Regardless of what what may think of Pope Francis, who of course is the most obvious, most famous Jesuit in in the world at the moment, sometimes his willingness to say and do surprising things is tied to his Ignatian DNA. Sometimes it's also just Jorge being Jorge, right? He he also has his own personality. So I don't want to get into what would be a whole other talk. But it's an interesting point that if Francis, if Pope Francis does sometimes say and do surprising things, sometimes that's him, and sometimes it's the Ignatian DNA, to be creative, to be compassionate um, in ways that remain with and in the church, but perhaps are, are unexpected or new. So that's the second of the, the thematic themes. And the third one, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll cover relatively briefly, it's simply to say that the heart and the conscience are central and fundamental, but the advice and the, the guidance of a mentor is indispensable. So for Ignatius, there's no such thing as freelance holiness. It, every, every, every saint is guided by another. Every saint is guided by, I'll use the word, an elder, someone who ordained or not, uh, a woman or man, but everyone is guided by someone himself or herself grounded in the, in the Christian tradition, grounded in the Catholic faith, who uh, provides guidance. The, the spirit, I mentioned earlier that the exercise is the book can't really be read from cover to cover because it, it doesn't lend itself to that. It's not meant to be a book that, that I take off on retreat and read through. It's, it's, it's a guide for the director, not for the directee. It's a guide for the one who is leading another through the exercises. Ignatius himself acknowledged the need for spiritual direction. And in what I think is one of the most poignant details of Ignatius' life, uh, he considered that the best director of the spiritual exercises was St. Pierre Favre. We, we say saint now, but Pierre Favre, his colleague. Think about that for a moment, how, how beautiful and humble it is that St. Ignatius of Loyola, who designed the spiritual exercises, turned to one of his brothers and says, this guy has it figured out. He knows how to guide another through the exercises. Not me. He didn't say, hey, everyone, I am, I am the one who will show you how to live the exercises most fully. He looked at those around him. And with that, with that Ignatian creativity and compassion said, here is someone who has the gift of the spirit to, to be a mentor, to be a, an elder, to guide someone else through the exercises and help them uh, reach holiness. So that's the third main theme. The heart and conscience of an individual are central, but the advice of a mentor is, is crucial. So let's think for a moment then <clears throat> about the practical strategy. So I mentioned that there were those three themes, those three uh, doctrinal anchor points. So let's look now at the, at the, the, the practical wisdom, Ignatius' discoveries, I think we could say. These really are points where Ignatius brought a particularly new perspective to the, to the Christian tradition. And there are four of these that I'd like to highlight, four discoveries or four practical points. The first is probably the phrase most often associated with Ignatius, and that is the, 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 the dyad consolation and desolation, consolatio and desolatio, the, the experience of, be, of being close to God and the experience of moving away from God. Many people who have not heard anything else or aren't familiar with Ignatius in any other way will have heard these expressions, consolation and desolation. To the point that uh, if some of you are involved in, in pastoral care, you may have noticed this, or if you, you haven't, I would encourage you to, to be on the lookout for this. Many, many of the faithful will, um, will apply or implement this, this notion of consolation and desolation in a very, uh, in a very earnest uh, way, but that is not in keeping with what Ignatius meant. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, 
one often meets uh, faithful who will say, I had this decision to make, I was trying to discern God's will, and, and such and such an option made me feel peaceful, and this other option made me feel uh, uh, tumultuous or in turmoil. And we'll, they'll conclude that this, this is consolation and desolation, that, that consolation is leading them in, towards the right decision and desolation is leading them towards the wrong decision or is identifying what is the wrong decision. It's, it's the right idea, but it's not quite what Ignatius meant, at least not as I read him. I think we have to understand that consolation and desolation for Ignatius are not a feeling but a trend. It's not a, mo- a, a feeling in time but a trend in one's life. So a consolation is not a momentary feeling of peace, but uh, the recognition that when I live with this decision, when I live with this option, when I follow this, this line of thought, the persistent trend is that I grow closer to God. And that desolation is the opposite trend. The desolation is the trend of moving away from God. So in other words, a consolation can be tough. A consolation can be unpleasant, which is a paradoxical thing to say, but it's important, I think, if we're going to understand Ignatius. That I might live with a decision or live with an option and think this would be a tough option and it makes me and it scares me but this is the decision that's leading me closer to God and this other option uh, maybe would come more easily but I notice that the trend is that it's leading me away from God so consolation and and desolation a second area of where Ignatius practical wisdom is is especially prominent is is the rules his rules for the discernment of spirit so he has two sets of rules uh, there's that there's that there's that military kind of theme coming through. He has two sets of guidelines, two sets of rules: one for the first week of the exercises, and one for the second week of the exercises. The idea is that if if we want to perceive where God is, and if we want to perceive where where the 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 enemy is, uh, because that is certainly present in Ignatius spirituality, the conviction that the Holy Spirit is present, but the conviction that the the enemy is constantly trying to throw the faithful off balance. If in the beginning of one's conversion, there are certain precepts that are useful to follow. And that once those foundations are in place, there's a, a second set of precepts that are useful to follow. So he has rules for the first week and rules for the second week. And he also has annotations, which are a series of commentaries on how the exercises are to be lived. I would say that these these simple they're they're simple to read they only take up a page or two of the exercises i would say that the annotations and the rules are uh, some of the richest uh, material to mine in ignatius for his insight Um, and uh, if you're interested in reading more about uh, or discovering more about the ignatian tradition uh, some of the most interesting work is done on the annotations and on the rules and uh, we could you could look at uh, for example the late michael ivan's uh, the American uh, Timothy Gallagher uh, and Jules Tonnerre as some of the most interesting commentators on on the on the uh, annotations and the rules. So I, I'll just give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things that make their way into the into the rules and the annotations. Uh, annotation two uh, states: It is not knowing much, but realizing and relishing things interiorly that contents and satisfies the soul. So in, in the sort of old-timey language that's inevitable in some translations of Ignatius, uh, essentially he's underlining the place of the heart, that the heart is central in conversion, the heart is central in holiness, and not the intellect alone. That's annotation two. So in that one brief sentence, a whole, a whole uh, body of spiritual w- wisdom is distilled. Annotation 22 is another example. Uh, and it's one of the toughest to follow and one of the most interesting to try and follow. So Annotation 22 uh, bids the, the director and the directee of the exercises to put the most charitable possible construction on the other person's words. Whatever a person says, Ignatius says, assume that they mean the best. Assume if, if your interpretation of what they said leads you to a conclusion about them that is, that is dishonorable or that you, you have to attribute bad motives to them, then think about it again. See if you can make a more charitable presumption. It's, it's a fascinating thing to tell a spiritual director to do, and it's a fascinating thing to tell a directee to do. When you enter into this, this relationship, I do this as a spirit, you know, this is a, perhaps not the most obvious illustration of a spiritual director relationship. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's this. But Ignatius tells everyone involved, assume the best of what the other person says. If what they're saying seems insane, 
you may not have understood it. You must not have understood it. Give, it an, give them another chance. Talk to them about it. So this has an obvious application in the spiritual direction relationship. But the, the wisdom of the annotation is shown throughout, throughout life, right? If, if there are some people in our lives, it's much easier to put a charitable presumption uh, or a charitable, charitable construction on their words than others. But it's in the cases where it's tough that it's most important as a, as a precept. So that's annotation 22. And one more example of the wisdom of these, these rules is rule number five from his first week rules. And that is, this is one you've probably encountered already. His rule number five of his first week rules is to say, make no changes in a time of desolation. If you are desolate, that is not the time to make a change in your life. So it's precisely at the moment where a person says, I have, I've had it with this person, I've had it with this relationship, I've had it with this job. And I've, I'm just I'm ready to throw it all aside. Ignatius doesn't say the decision to throw it aside is wrong, but he would say that's not the time to make that decision. Oh. Don't make that decision in a time of desolation. Why? Again, because for Ignatius, among other things, the 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 enemy's chief tool is discouragement and to throw one off balance. And it's at those moments that one must, you know, keep a steady course and and wait until the storm has passed to make those decisions. So those are examples of that second point. The third uh, Ignatian uh, strategy is always ask for a grace. This is something that comes up over and over and over in the spiritual exercises, and it comes up over and over in commentaries on the exercises. Ignatius is convinced that one should always ask for a grace. Anytime one embarks on prayer, anytime one embarks on a meditation, it should not be, it, it should be in a spirit of prayer. But he explicitly says, always ask for a grace. Let, it be, let there be something that you desire and manifest that desire in your prayer. And I'll, I'll come back to what, how this might be significant for us uh, a little bit later. But it strikes me as, as something very distinctively Ignatian. No matter what you do, in effect, it's a, it's a confession of neediness, right? We, the, it's, a, it's an invitation not to embark on prayer with the idea that we have anything to offer God, but to embark on prayer recognizing I need everything, so here's this is the grace I need. And it could be whatever the grace might be that you stand most in need of. But always, Ignatius says, always ask for a grace. That phrase, the, the thing you desire, the thing that you want, comes up over and over in the, in the exercises. And then a last strategy, and one that we'll, we'll come back to uh, quite a bit at the, at the end, is the enthusiastic and intense engagement of the imagination in prayer. Uh, in, in Ignatius, it's called the compositio loci, the composition of place, to place oneself in one's mind, in one's imagination, place oneself in the scenes of the Gospels. Um, David Fleming, who is a, a significant Ignatian writer, unpacks this uh, place of the imagination by, by describing it as remembering and imagining. So, Fleming points out that for Ignatius, we constantly should be remembering what God has done in one's life and constantly imagining, for example, the scenes from the Gospels. So it is an exercise of the imagination. The imagination is absolutely central and crucial in Ignatian spirituality. And you may, you may see where, where that is going, but we'll, we'll come back to that. So that's Ignatian spirituality in a nutshell. Um, and in the in the, the second sort of half of the, the presentation, I'd like to look at points of convergence and points of divergence, points uh, of convergence between Ignatian and Byzantine spirituality, as I understand it, and points of divergence. So let's start with, with convergence. And I do want a, a disclaimer at the beginning. I, I know that, of course, hesychasm is not synonymous with Byzantine spirituality, but is an important uh, and central example or, or part of that tradition. And so I'm aware that uh, to speak of hesychasm is not to, to speak of the entire Byzantine tradition, but because of its importance, I will often be referring specifically to the hesychastic tradition. So points of convergence. Uh, what are some ways in which Ignatian spirituality and Byzantine spirituality are uh, affirm some of the same things? The first I would have to say is their serious attention and devotion to the mother of God. Uh, in Ignatius... Uh, inv the invocation of the Mother of God is not is not a, a pleasantry or simply a, a formality to be observed. 
one of the major moments in each of the meditations that Ignatius proposes is what he calls the colloquy, where one where one explicitly prays, when one one addresses the Father, one addresses uh, Christ, and one addresses the Mother of God. So the, the 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 Mother of God is brought into every Ignatian meditation, and not as a formality, but as really um, something central to the experience of of being of growing in holiness. So that's that's a point that I see in both both traditions. Second, uh, a second point is one that I've already alluded to, the role of the elder, the role of the, the director, the role of another in, in guiding one. Everyone, um, everyone needs, to be, uh, needs to be guided by, uh, uh, by another who is grounded in prayer. Um, a, a recent and much-loved uh, bishop in Montreal who has gone on to another diocese um, had a habit of saying that if you if you are your own spiritual director, you have an idiot for a spiritual director. So he he was, he was a man of, of uh, blunt speech, as you can tell. But uh, so in blunt words or in blunt terms, that is the the role of the elder. Another point of convergence is the danger of illusion, the danger of logismoi or, or prelists or whatever whatever the tradition may call them. Uh, all seem agreed that. Uh, it is possible for our thoughts themselves to be unhealthy. It is possible for our thoughts themselves to be what lead us astray. Um, it's an ancient insight, but one that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy recognizes as, as being a, a, a sensible insight. Our thoughts themselves can be what lead us astray. Another point of convergence is that what is most important uh, in terms of faith is adherence to orthodoxy and not the multiplication of devotions for their own sake. So what, what the the... The core, the, the faith that is shared by all Christians has to be the, the primary touchstone. Um, and additional doctrines and devotions should not be multiplied for their own sake, but only insofar as they aid the person in attaining the principle and foundation, in securing the principle and foundation. Um, you remember uh, I was listing those Ignatian hashtags, so this is a, a new point of convergence. I was listing those Ignatian hashtags, and one of them is finding God in all things. So the goodness of creation, which is a, something that uh, Augustine Cassidy uh, considers uh, a defining feature of Byzantine spirituality, is certainly also a, a defining feature of, of Ignatian spirituality. Um, another point of convergence, attention to physical disposition. What, where is it that you pray? How is it that you pray? What is your surrounding when you pray? Although I will have an important bemol, an important qualification to add to this uh, momentarily, but especially in the first week, Ignatius says, do whatever you need to do in order to have a suitable environment for prayer. And he even proposes if you need to be in a, a dark room with the, the blinds drawn in order to reflect adequately on your radical neediness, do that. It's, it's, it's not an appealing prospect, but Ignatius urges us to adopt whatever physical disposition and surrounding is needed for those uh, for those exercises to be effective. And as we'll see, that is also a, a feature, at least in, in some uh, expressions of the Byzantine tradition. And there are there are there are two more that I uh, that I want to list as points of convergence: the gift of tears, pentos, which is so dear to Ignatius under the title "Shame and Confusion." was dear as well to Evagrius, to the Cappadocians, to Isaac the Syrian. So in the first week, that difficult, that, that, uh, that tough first week in the, in the room with the blinds drawn, if that's, if that's what you need, in that first week, uh, the grace that Ignatius urges us to pray for is a most unappealing grace. It's the, one of the most unappealing graces one can possibly pray for. He, he urges us to pray for the grace of shame and confusion. It, it sounds like an odd thing to pray for, right? Like, I, I, I'm confused enough without praying for a grace of confusion, and not to mention shame. But Ignatius is not saying, Ignatius is not urging the exorcitant to, to pray to be burdened, to pray to be discouraged. Ignatius is praying for the grace of pentos, or of, of tears, the, the gift of, of tears for, one's, for ways in which one has fallen short of God's call. So I think a lot of the ink that has been spilled and the tears that have been spilled, for that matter, over this, this phrase, shame and confusion, would be, uh, would be corrected if we understood the, the grace of shame and confusion as a prayer for the grace of tears, the gift of tears, the gift of, 
of, of uh, uh, sorrow for whatever separates us from, from God. And a last point uh, that I see a point of convergence is uh, Hesychus, like Simeon, uh, Simeon the, the, the new theologian, sought to make the grace of baptism real and efficacious. That's Meyendorf's phrase. Uh, Simeon sought to make the grace of baptism real and efficacious to all. So they promoted uh, Meyendorf speaking of the 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 the, the Hesychus, uh, notes that they promoted the Jesus prayer outside of the monastery to the faithful to whomever whomever was interested. And this this notion this theme of the universality of the call to holiness is one that we also see in the Ignatian tradition. Um, I mentioned the annotations earlier, the things that Ignatius proposes as ways of, of modifying the spiritual exercises. One of his annotations is called Annotation 19, and it proposes that if you cannot leave your work and your family for a month, you can do the exercises in daily life. So m most people, I would say nowadays, who do the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius do it according to Annotation 19. So it means that instead of going off for a month, you take an hour a day and for eight months or so while you continue to conduct your daily affairs. So this this is a convergence to me, a point where Ignatius uh, and the Ignatian tradition seek to make the fruits of the exercises available to everyone, even those who, whose family and other obligations mean that they can't, uh, they can't just take off for a month. I want to get into the points of divergence, but uh, maybe I'll pause for a moment and just see if there's anything that requires clarification, anything that, that stands out. And Yeah. yeah um, you mentioned uh, the four weeks and then the, the first thing was sort of associated with the first week, but there was only three things. So I was wondering, you talk about three things instead of four. That's all I, 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 were they to correspond with each week? No, was, no. They weren't, no. So the three themes are just general traits of Ignatian spirituality, but the theme of freedom is particularly tied to the first week. But there's, but the, the themes don't map to the weeks. The, once you're through the first week, um, the, uh, the, the, the other weeks of the Ignatian exercises are, are gradual, uh, a gradually concentrating focus on the life of Christ uh, as, as, as uh, related by the Gospels. Yeah, so all of those traits are sort of present um, throughout the, the weeks. Yeah. In your fourth point, when you said the points of convergence, you said what is important in faith-based orthodoxy, not additional doctrines and devotions. But I thought all your additional doctrines should be include, presumably include in the orthodoxy. Uh, no, so what, what I'm uh, the, the point I'm trying to highlight is that for Ignatius, he um, what is most important, the most important reference point is the orthodox faith. Uh, we can say the, the Orthodox Catholic faith, small O, capital C, whatever combination or permutation of O's and C's you like. But it's the, 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 uh, the reference point being the, the common faith of Christians, that that's what's most important. And various private revelations and devotions and practices, uh, whatever form they may take, those are secondary. Those have to be uh, take, taken or left depending on, uh, on whether or not they aid the individual. But a person should not make some particular devotion uh, more important than the, the, than the, the fundamental practice of, of, uh, of the faith. Yeah. Um, maybe just a remark. Uh, as far as I know, uh, maybe in, in ancient times, uh, the principles and foundations were the part of the first week, but uh, today, as a usual, when you are doing the uh, spiritual exercise, principles and foundations are separated from the first week. You can, you can do principles and foundations separately from the whole uh, exercises. Uh, and uh, you can do this many times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and also about the uh, this uh, uh, wish uh, to be sick or uh, or uh, healthy. As far as I know, that uh, one must always uh, take uh, into account uh, the way of life. If I'm a married man and I have two children, I cannot wish to be a sick. Uh, this is like a very <laughs> And the, uh, the directors always uh, use this command. Uh, you must always consider your way of life. Uh, and because if you have uh, uh, children uh, that are dependent on you, so you cannot wish to be a sick man. <laughs> no. uh, uh, of course. Can, I mean, this is not, you must always consider uh, who are you. 
Yes, but I mean, I think that applies regardless of one's state of life. In, in a sense, it's not if someone is willing to be sick, for instance, the, it's, it's not that one should go out and purposefully get sick, right? Like the, the idea of that, that, that Im- imagining a radically undesirable outcome, it's not so much to say that it would be, let's say, for a, a person with a family, even for a person without a family, but anyone with obligations. Um, sickness is, cannot really be seen as something completely... Uh, decontextualized but one thing that sickness and poverty have in common and the other examples have in common is that they aren't what we naturally desire and it's that freedom that is emphasized for sure um, the options that one can consider a person Ignatius doesn't imagine that a person who is married would do the exercises and conclude as a result that they ought to abandon their family or that a person who has uh, 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 made some other commitment would would abandon that commitment. So that it's an important point. Yeah, but I my focus wasn't so much on uh, uh, a freedom to the point that one's obligations are 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 sacrificed, but a freedom to the point that one's own preferences uh, one's own preferences are sacrificed. I was just gonna just time period. If not, if you can just. But I just wanted to push you a bit on the um, shame and confusion being mm. equated to tears because I'm not sure I can. We agree. I would agree with shame being equated to the gift of tears, right? Because, like, you know, like when you're going through purgation, you know what you God reveals to you what you did, and you're ashamed, and that's the shame. But I think the confusion is more. I think Ignatius is taking it beyond in a way that the gift of tears doesn't, in that by confusing us, it's kind of like the story where Jesus cures the Blind, the man born blind, and at the end he says to the Pharisees, like, you know, because you ask this, you don't realize you're blind, because you need to be blind in order to see. And I think that's what Ignatius is saying with confusion. It's the grace not only to be purged of our, and, you know, purified for our sins, but also the grace to be in this soul confusion that we realize we can't depend on ourselves, and we have to put into account the PNF. Right. Right, yeah, I think that the, the word confusion causes a lot of, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to say it and then I didn't want to say it, but there you go. It's a, so it, it, part of the problem is, whether the, is the question of whether or not that is the most apt translation of, the, of the, the, the word that Ignatius uses and what exactly he means by it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, at the very least, we can, we can say that he's referring to something that, that throws off or casts aside the things we have taken for granted or the things are, are the, the little bits of flotsam and jetsam that we cling to on the on the shipwreck of, of, of our of our need for conversion. Uh, and so the, the confusion seems to be praying for the grace to let go of the flotsam um, as much as that, that feels like one will be flailing in the in the open sea. Yes. If you say uh, all these ask for a grace when in prayer mm-hmm. um, to the layperson, there's a bit of a contradiction here. On the one hand, we're taught to follow the will of the Lord, and yet here we're saying we're asking for a grace. So the answer could be no, or the Lord gives you a different grace. Could be, but one has to ask, right? Like it's the the. I think there's there's a lot uh, built into that prayer or to, into that precept to always ask for a grace. But what I see uh, as being most central to it is a is a childlike confession of neediness, that we're not coming into prayer to uh, embark on some impressive intellectual exercise that, 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 that looks charming or that looks impressive. It's, it's a confession before our Father that we stand completely in need of everything that is valuable. And, and right now, this is what I need. And yeah, the answer may be no, but I, that won't stop me from asking. Right? That, so it's the, it's the confession of, of deep neediness. And... and not just neediness, but a confession of trust as well. That's more importantly than the neediness is it's a confession of trust. Any other thoughts before we continue? So, as far as divergences go, there are four particular ones that I that I want to mention uh, of varying levels of importance and complexity. So, one point of divergence. Uh, it's not really a contradiction, it's just a, perhaps a reflection of the, the Eastern and Western traditions, respectively. Ignatius doesn't really talk, uh, as I read him, doesn't really talk about the liturgy. 
He assumes faithful attendance at the Mass as an ordinary feature of observant Christian life. But uh, contrast this, uh, so the example that comes to mind for me is if, if ever you, you're in a group, uh, I'm, I think I am now, but if everyone is in a group of, of, uh, of Byzantine Christians and someone, a, a good-natured inquirer says, what should I read? What should I read to know more about the Eastern tradition? You can, the, the chorus will arise from all corners, attend, be at the Divine Liturgy. You, you can read other things, but pray at the Divine Liturgy. Join us for the Liturgy. Sing with us and pray with us. Then you can read stuff, but first be at the Liturgy and pray with us. That is not, Ignatius's approach is not really a Western answer, right? If, if someone were to say, what must I know about Roman Catholicism? You might say, be at Mass, but that would be sort of, it would be a secondary thing. And that, that the, the, the place of the liturgy in, in Ignatius, I think, reflects that, uh, reflects a certain divergence. Um, now, why might, that, why might that be the case? Why is the liturgy so central in the, the Byzantine tradition? It seems to be a question of beauty and therefore a question of the heart, right? Like, it's, as, as I see it, uh, as I would presume to say, when I look at that emphasis in the Byzantine tradition on being at the liturgy as the primary way to encounter uh, the Byzantine approach, it is, it is really an invitation to allow one's heart to be touched by beauty. That is not the Latin approach. And that's not a, that's not a, a, a jive against the Latin liturgy. I think that even in its most elaborate, most classic form, one might describe the Latin liturgy as sober and stately, but I, I don't know that one would normally describe it as, as sublime in the way that, that uh, the, the divine liturgy um, is in the Byzantine tradition. And in most parishes, in most Latin parishes, um, the, the, the Novus Order, the new form of the liturgy, it's not, sublime is not the word that would be used for it, but even if it's respectful, right? Like I'm not, again, I'm not saying that as a jive, but even when it's done very respectfully, it's, it's sort of homely, domestic, quotidian, which actually suits the ordinariness of the spiritual exercises very well. The exercises are very much about encountering God in the ordinary circumstances of one's life. And so where does the liturgy fit into the spiritual exercises? Make sure you, you go to Mass, receive communion reverently, and, and you know, say your prayers. Like it's, it's, the liturgy is there as a, as a support to ordinary life, whereas in the Byzantine tradition, I see the liturgy as itself an encounter with the beauty of God and uh, an, an opportunity for one's heart to be touched by the beauty of God. So that's a, a first point of divergence. A second point of divergence, uh, and this is p particularly about uh, the hesychastic tradition, and, and that is the, the it's a, it seems like a fairly narrow point, but there's, of, the, of what has been written about Ignatius and the Byzantine tradition, a surprising amount has been written about this point, and that is the, the importance of breathing, of controlling one's breathing in, in, in prayer. So some authors compare Ignatius. Ignatius proposes different ways of praying, and one of them is to pray in time with one's breathing, to pray, let's say, the Our Father in a manner that is rhythmic, in a, in a manner that's in time with one's uh, uh, breath, uh, drawing breath in and, and breathing out. Um, and some authors uh, imply that this is similar to the uh, hesychastic tradition of, of, of paying close attention, of carefully moderating one's breathing uh, and one's posture. Um, but it's, it, is, it seems to be an illusory uh, convergence. I, I, I do see this as a different point. But the, as much as Ignatius uh, does propose this as a way to pray, saying you can you know, pray the Our Father and time your, your each sentence to coincide with your breathing in and your breathing out, it's really simply a way to slow down our praying. It's not really about breathing, it's about time. It's about taking the time to pray thoughtfully. As much as as much as Ignatius, uh, as much as Ignatius's comments on breathing should not be taken as as a preoccupation with breathing itself, of course, uh, as we'll see, uh, uh, a number of commentators point out that even in the hesychastic tradition, this emphasis on breathing is not the only approach and it's not the universal approach. That it's it's one particular method, and it need not be tied to uh, need not be tied to the the practice of of. Uh, of the practice of the prayer of quiet. I, uh, the third point is very closely related to it. Um, the second point was uh, of divergence was on the, around the, the theme of breathing. The third point is around the, the question of posture. 
And I don't want to spend too much time on that. I'll simply, I'll, I'll simply say this, that uh, posture in itself is not something that Ignatius prescribes. He doesn't say there is one particular way you should sit or stand or pray. In fact, what he says is that uh, you should find the way of praying that allows you to pray best. And that might mean walking around. It might mean sitting in that darkened room. Uh, it might mean any number of things. So uh, this is uh, an observation that uh, Irene Hausherr makes. He points out that Ignatius cares about posture, but only in the sense that he urges us to, f to pay attention to posture and find the way of praying that will allow us to pray best. But he doesn't say that there's only one one way to sit or to uh, or to, to only one way to pray. And in the the method that's a, a, that's associated with uh, Nisiphorus, uh, there's a particular method of sitting, a particular way to sit, a particular way to pray. For someone coming from outside that tradition, from coming outside uh, at least Nisiphorus's tradition, it does seem peculiar. It is something that 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 seems at odds with the, the, the freedom or, or even with um, the dependence on grace that, that typifies uh, the, the Christian faith, whether East or West. Um, so as much as, as Ignatius emphasizes freedom in posture, there are some expressions of the hesychastic tradition that don't emphasize freedom, but that particularly uh, propose a particular method. But this is where I think um, Meyendorf, I found Meyendorf a very helpful author, um, and in particular his study of St. Gregory Palamas. Meyendorf, um, looking at the, the hesychastic tradition, certainly emphasizes freedom a lot more than a particular prescription of a posture or a way of breathing. For, for Meyendorf, um, this emphasis on posture isn't what's most important. Instead, what's most important is custody of the heart. And reading that in mind, or for me, was a very helpful insight into the way in which Byzantine and, and Ignatian uh, traditions uh, are, are actually affirming some of the same values. Uh, for Meyendorf, what matters most to the, the prayer of quiet, the hesychastic tradition, is custody of the heart. Are you, are you keeping your eyes on Christ? And then the fourth and final... Uh, point of divergence, uh, and it's probably the most important one, the point where there's a most, the most obvious apparent conflict between the Byzantine and Ignatian traditions is the place of the imagination. Um, in many expressions of hesychastic spirituality, it is explicitly said do not to use the imagination in prayer. So for example, in the Philokalia, uh, when doing your task of prayer, uh, if you see a light or fire outside of yourself or inside yourself, or you see a face of Christ or an angel, do not accept it in order not to suffer damage. And do not make images, and those that come on their own, do not accept them and do not allow your mind to keep them. That's it's pretty emphatic, right? Like it's, There's not a lot of room for, for, uh, for negotiation there. Uh, Evagrius, when you are praying, do not fancy the divinity like some image formed within yourself. And uh, Meyendorf uh, summarizes, um, uh, Meyendorf says the following, Gregory of Sinai insists on an essential aspect of the Orthodox mystical tradition that the most dangerous enemy to union with God is imagination in any shape or form, voluntary or involuntary. Again, it doesn't leave a lot of room for, for maneuver. So it's a very, very uh, emphatic statement. And we've already seen, uh, or I've alluded to, how important imagination is in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. So this is more than, to me, this is more than an academic problem. This isn't simply something that one, that exercises one in, in idle moments. It's a real pastoral problem. Because if, if, the, if the, the Ignatian tradition is a genuine way of holiness, and one that a, a Christian can propose and can practice and propose to others in good faith, it has to be one that is acceptable to, to East and West. It cannot be that the use of images is only harmful to those who happen to be Byzantine Christians. That wouldn't, that wouldn't make any sense. So the apparent contrast, the apparent conflict there is one that's, that's of real pastoral importance. So I've been, it's a point about which I've been thinking and, and reading a lot recently in the past month. So one of the reasons, when, uh, when Brian invited me to, to speak, uh, it, it came to mind as something that I, I wanted to think about some more. And what I have 
what I think I have understood, and, and this is where I venture onto thin ice or perhaps a shaky branch or whatever, whatever metaphor of fragility and vulnerability you want to, you want to use, um, I, I think that the conflict between these two is, is, is not a real conflict, or at least the, the conflict um, is between... The conflict actually illustrates a, a point of, of, uh, of great agreement. So how can I claim that? It seems to me from my reading in the Byzantine tradition, such as it is, and I, I make no claim to, to great erudition, it seems to me that the warning in the Byzantine literature is against certain consequences or certain contexts for those, uh, those images. Uh, for example, Simeon the New Theologian warns against being puffed up with pride at the imaginary pictures one construes. So that's an important qualification that the, the danger of the image is not the image, but the pride of thinking that one has, one has concocted something new or that one has been given something, uh, something new. This strikes me as similar to the warnings in John of the Cross against heeding visions and remarkable phenomena. We see that in John of the Cross, who's a thoroughly Western um, uh, mystical writer. John urges us not to pay any attention to visions and remarkable phenomena because they're more likely to do harm than good. It's good, it's good solid practical advice that the holiness comes from the practice of, the, of prayer and the sacraments. And if you have some remarkable experience, some remarkable image, some remarkable vision, it's best ignored, if it, especially if it is causing one to be puffed up with pride. Um, Gregory of Nyssa's distinction between the, the, the divine essence and the divine energies preserves the inaccess inaccessibility of God while making divine life accessible. And this suggests a caution about what we think we're imagining when we imagine at prayer. So this too uh, is a really important qualification. What is it that Ignatius urges us to imagine? Ignatius, for the most part, doesn't urge us to imagine the Father. There's a couple of exceptions to that, and, uh, and I do want to, to come back to those if we have time. But by and large, the images that Ignatius urges us to meditate with are images from the Gospels. They're the life of, the life of Christ, the, the, the icon, the, the, the human face of God. So if, if what, for example, if Gregory of Nyssa, uh, uh, in, in his distinction between the essence and the energies, if this suggests a caution uh, about what we think we're imagining when we imagine at prayer, it is a caution not to think we can imagine God in God's essence, not to, not to think that we, we can picture God to ourselves apart from the incarnation. But that is the key qualification, isn't it? That Ignatius isn't urging us to imagine God apart from the incarnation. He generally only urges us to imagine the incarnation, and not the incarnation as we have, have made it up for ourselves, but the, the incarnation as, as recorded in the Gospels. A number of authors have pointed out that even in the Byzantine tradition, there are examples where the imagination is encouraged, where use of the imagination is encouraged. Is encouraged. So, for example, Evagrius, uh, in one place, categorically urges his reader to imagine hell. Uh, it's not a, very, not a very cheerful exercise, but he imagines the reader to imagine hell, to imagine their corpse and their body after death in order to nurture the gift of tears. So it's, it's, a, it's an explicit invitation to use the imagination. Imagine yourself dead. You know, it's it it's it's not it's it's not a cheerful thought, but it's definitely use of the imagination. And uh, you may be thinking uh, one of the most obvious suggestions that the Byzantine uh, precept against using the imagination is not uh, is not everything it appears to be at first glance. Of course, is the the place of icons in the Byzantine tradition. So icons. As I don't need to tell, this group is a cherished, con or a cherished context for prayer. Um, and although it is, it is apropos to warn against worshipping images as though they themselves were the, the being honoured, the, as long as one is aware that it is but an image, then, then the, the, the danger is averted and, and the prayer is meant to be rooted in, in the senses, rooted in what we see and what we, what we hear and, and taste and touch and smell. So, coming back to the point that the exercises are mainly about events from the Gospels, in other words, they are seldom about inventing images of God, and they're more often about beholding the incarnate and therefore imaged God. Uh, 
Jesus is the human face of God for East and for West. And thus the rationale for using the imagination in meditation is the same as the rationale for using icons. So if I can claim that on this po- even on this point, East and West actually affirm the same values uh, or same, uh, affirm the same truths about prayer and about God, I would say this. Hesychasm, as I understand it, aims to give the soul an experience of the kingdom of God founded on the past historic fact of the ascension and the future historic fact of the second coming. Whereas Ignatius aims to give the soul tools to discern God's spirit wherever the kingdom is under construction by placing the soul in contact with the historic fact of the life of Jesus. So if Byzantine spirituality is profoundly about the conversion of the heart through the contemplation of beauty, it is a metanoia through teoria, a a change of heart through vision. Where is the one place in the New Testament where we find that word teoria? It's in Luke chapter 23. The crowds had gathered to see the sight of Jesus on the cross. The crowds had gathered to see what? The sight of Jesus, to, to see the teoria, to see the thing that was to be seen, which was the crucified God. So the point of this was not entertainment. The point was not uh, diversion. And the point was not to merely make up a picture. The point was metanoia, a change of heart through beholding, uh, beholding God. So the most important convergence is thus that Ignatian spirituality is about allowing the Holy Spirit to shape the heart by an encounter, a Taurian looking on the icon of Christ himself and his mother. So if this is true, if, if uh, the Byzantine warnings are warnings against pride and warnings against idolatry, then the point on which the deepest chasm seems to yawn between Ignatius and Byzantium on the use of imagination and prayer is largely an, an illusory chasm. The condemnation is not of imagination per se, but of vain, prideful delusions of extraordinary phenomena and idolatrous depictions of the invisible God. And if we focus instead on Christ, who is the human face of God, and on the encounter with him related in the Gospels, we are up to something quite different, provided we do so in a spirit of recollection and in the spirit of asking for a grace. So what do East and West agree? That we cannot begin to pray without placing ourselves needily before the Father, placing ourselves in all of our poverty before the Father and asking for a grace and to be recollected. If anything is distracting us, those things must be put aside, whether it's through reciting the Jesus prayer or through finding a place where one can meditate on the events of the Gospels. The humble and needy sine qua nons of Ignatian prayer and hesychasm alike are to confess before God our neediness and to gaze on the face, the human face of God in the, in the person of, of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you.